Uppama Gauti. I'm president of AAPI, and uh, I want to welcome all of you today, our beloved members, our moderator, Dr. Ravi Kohli of the evening, and uh, our great speakers, Dr. Jerome Adams. No one, there's no one who doesn't know him, our former Surgeon General, and uh, Professor Dr. Alexander Nicolescu. Uh, founder Mindex Sciences, Professor of Psychiatry and Medical Neurosciences, Indiana University School of Medicine, and uh, Sunil Hazari, President Mindex Sciences. And uh, so recent times, uh, we, we are seeing actually, we are through the pandemic right now, unfortunately, extended pandemic now, but uh, the effects of the pandemic, what we are seeing are very alarming and uh, very sad actually. The rate of suicide has gone up and uh, even in our medical profession, uh, what we see now, uh, residents, uh, medical students going through the stress and physicians going through the stress. So all of us have at one point have this feeling that why am I doing this or why should I continue my life? At one point in our lives, I think we all get that feeling in ourselves, but we overcome that feeling because of our inherent social support or family support or friends or you know you won't go through that but to some it doesn't stop there it takes them further so this is the month of uh, suicide prevention month so we all want to hear from our great speakers of tonight and I don't want to waste much time uh, I give to Dr. Ravi Kohli our president-elect of AAPI, and he himself is a psychiatrist. He deals with it every day in his life. And uh, Ravi, go ahead and uh, get started. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, members, uh, and my dear happy members. Thank you for all coming. And um, uh, like Anupama, our president said, uh, this is a month of suicide prevention, and uh, we have some great uh, Speakers here, uh, of course, they don't need no introduction. Dr. Jerome Adams, a uh, friend of RP, and uh, he has been there last year during our convention, I mean, webinars, and I actually had the pleasure of moderating that event too. So it's kind of coincident. We are meeting again here. And uh, of course, Bob Alexander Nicolescu doesn't, he's a pioneer in this field of uh, precision medicine and psychiatry, whose time has arrived. He's going to give us some exciting uh, information, new information and cutting edge information. And um, so I'm looking forward to, uh, let's start with uh, Dr. Jerome Adams. Uh, like I said, he doesn't need any introduction. Let's start with him and listen, let's listen to him. And uh, like I, Anupama said, um, mental health is a burden that has been kind of a pandemic under the pandemic. Um, 50%, more than 50% of Americans at lifetime suffer mental health problems. And at least uh, any given year, one in five, one in five, 20% have a diagnosable mental health problem. And uh, suicide is a major out, uh, catastrophic outcome. And as we speak, every 40 seconds, one person is committing suicide across the globe. We have 800,000 people committing suicide in the world. So the statistics are staggering and mind numbing. So we need better option, better ways of treating them, better ways to uh, destigmatize the illness and uh, bring them to the treatment early. And we'll have some great uh, information today that will help us to be more kind of empowered in helping these patients. And uh, in the age group of 15 to 29, this is the second leading cause of death, suicide. So this is a very serious problem. And uh, a current Surgeon General, uh, Dr. Marty is all, Murthy is also very much oriented to mental health. And uh, he wrote a book on loneliness recently. Mm -hmm. And without much ado, I would like to have Dr. Adams talk first and then, and then I'll introduce Dr. Nicholas Ku next after that. Thank you, Dr. Adams. It's the floor Great. and the mic and the screen is yours. <laughs> Great, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to address, again, this group that is a, a group of friends to me. And I, I uh, just really always enjoy getting a chance to speak to, to you. And uh, Dr. Coley, it's, it's great to see you again. And I'm so glad that you mentioned uh, the, the statistics uh, from a mental health standpoint, that you framed it from a larger standpoint, because um, I gave a talk just last week about the intersection between mental health and social justice. 
And uh, the point that I made there was that our mental health um, disparities and the lack of attention that we give to mental health relative to physical health issues truly uh, are social justice um, issues that we should be paying attention to when you look at the disparities by age, when you look at the disparities by race, when you look at the disparities by, by income. And so it's really um, great that we're coming together today to talk about uh, Suicide Prevention Week. It's a week we remember the far too many lives we've lost to suicide, but also when we acknowledge those who have survived a suicide attempt and gone on to lead long and healthy lives, as well as those who contemplated suicide, but have had a successful intervention. More than 20 years ago, one of my mentors and predecessors, uh, Surgeon General David Satcher, issued the landmark report, the Surgeon General's Call to Action to Prevent Suicide, recognizing suicide as a major public health issue and calling for a national response. And since then, other surgeons general, such as myself and Dr. Murphy and many others have established a solid foundation for suicide prevention in the United States, but much work remains to be done. The National Strategy for Suicide Prevention identifies 13 goals and 60 objectives that address every aspect of suicide prevention from fostering healthy and empowered individuals, families and communities to providing effective prevention strategies and clinical care. As Surgeon General, I worked with the Action Alliance to highlight six areas where I feel we've made progress, but also where we have more work to do, including improving suicide risk identification in healthcare settings. One of the key recommendations from a Surgeon General's call to action that I put out in January of this year. And, and I want everyone to understand that like other public health issues, such as obesity and cancer, Suicide is influenced by many factors. As a result, suicide prevention efforts have to engage all sectors, including public health, mental health, traditional health care, social services, our military and veterans, businesses, entertainment, media, faith communities, education, and it must also include leveraging the power of new technologies and of innovation. New sectors have become involved, and we've observed an increase in public awareness that suicide is preventable. However, suicide remains a serious and unfortunately a growing public health problem. In 2019, more than 47,000 people died by suicide and a reported 10 million or more struggled with serious thoughts of suicide. As you heard, 2020 was an interesting year. Uh, we saw suicides actually go down nationally slightly, but they, it, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't equal across the United States. There were many pockets of the country where suicides actually went up quite a bit last year. And we certainly saw other deaths of despair, such as overdoses skyrocket last year. Overdoses increased by 30%. So uh, I want us again to think of these collectively as risk factors because uh, upstream, there are commonalities, Downstream, they play out in many different ways. Suicide is one of them. Suicide attempts and deaths by suicide, we don't wanna put a cost on an individual life, but at some point we have to help people understand the burden on our nation. And, and these cost our nation more than $93 billion per year in medical cost and lost productivity. So even if you're not personally interested, in preventing suicides, even if you don't know no one, if you don't know someone who's been impacted by it, it is incredibly important as a nation that we understand it costs all of us when we don't do all we can to prevent this disease. And that's why early detection is key because the most important thing for everyone to remember and for everyone to reiterate, especially this week, is that suicides are not inevitable, they are preventable. And that's why we must embrace precision medicine as a prevention tool. We think of precision medicine for cancer. We think of precision medicine for, uh, for genetic therapies, uh, but we don't really think about precision medicine as a mental health prevention tool. And that's why I was glad to be able to help advise and guide Mindex as Mindex as a company is developing the tools and has many of the tools already to make an impact from an app to keep track of suicidal ideation, 
to a digital assessment that provides a risk score and a personalized mitigation plan to a blood test that matches people with nutraceuticals and pharmaceuticals to help them decrease their suicidality. Mindex has also developed similar tools looking at the three main upstream causes of suicide, mood disorders, PTSD, and pain. And all these tools are based on academic research done over several decades by Dr. Dr. Nicolescu and his collaborators. And they've now been transformed into products that can be used by doctors, patients, insurers, and organizations. The fact is these tools make your job easier because they decrease uncertainty and they provide practical solutions. So I wanna close by saying never before has the need been greater, but never before have the technologies and opportunities for prevention been more promising. That's why today I'm calling on all of you to commit to using the knowledge and the tools we have to prevent suicides, because we know it can be done. We know it must be done. And we know it's up to each of us to make sure it's done. Go to surgeongeneral.gov, check out my call to action on suicide prevention. And please, please give your full attention to Dr. Dr. Nicolescu, the founder of Mindex Sciences, to talk more about the work he's doing to promote precision mental health. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Bob Nicolescu. Thank you, Dr. Adams, for that call to action uh, on uh, behalf of uh, all physicians and all scientists for taking this challenge and addressing it. And I have distinct pleasure of introducing now the next speaker, Dr. Alexander Bob Nicolescu, MD, PhD. He has done his uh, research at Scripps Institute in San Diego. And uh, like Dr. Adam said, uh, suicide risk pre uh, prediction is a very fraught uh, field. We have a lot of demographic uh, uh, issues and uh, psychological factors, as well as uh, psychiatric factors that affect uh, suicide out as an outcome. So all our probabilistic determinants uh, are not very precise. So we need something beyond those things. That's what Dr. Nicolescu is going to talk about precision medicine in psychiatry. And there is no better person to talk about than Dr. Alexander Nicolescu. And he's the, currently the professor of psychiatry at Indiana School of Medicine, one of the largest schools of medicine in India, in America. And uh, the suicide is a, a big issue in India as well. Uh, one student is killing themselves every hour in India, apparently. 10,000 people are killing themselves. In India, pressure is very high. Uh, just like in Japan, as a suicide is very high in India. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Japan uh, recently started a Ministry of Loneliness, just like UK did in 2019. Uh, Japan had a Ministry of Loneliness just uh, started in February. So we have a lot of issues to talk about. I won't take too much of uh, audience time here. So the, my, the screen is yours, Dr. Nicholas Kupfer. We're really excited. We're really looking forward to hear some cutting edge information from you. And I, I heard you talk, and it's uh, you. You'll, it will be very informative to all the attendees today. Thank Go you ahead, very much. Please. Thank you very much, Ravi, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Jerome. It's uh, um, Jerome is a hard act to follow. Um, he, you know, gave me a wonderful uh, setup for this. Uh, so did uh, Ravi. Um, I'll try to keep this informal, not very technical. We're all colleagues. Um, it's been a long day for a lot of us. Uh, I took my tie off about an hour and a half ago <laughs> after, you know, a nonstop day. Um, so, you know, we'll keep it informal and we'll discuss among colleagues uh, what, uh, what are some of the tools that uh, are uh, coming down the pike? How can they help your practice? How can they make your um, life easier? And more importantly, how can we save lives with them? Um, so um, I'm sort of uh, bringing you some of the things that um, have been in, developed in academia for the last two decades. So when Jerome was mentioning this work uh, occurred over a decade, I was thinking, well, you know, I, I should crack a joke that I started in high school. It makes me sound really old, but uh, it's been a, two, almost two decades since we started on this journey. And uh, the impetus for moving it into the practical realm and starting um, a company to get this into doctors and patients' hands was that every time we completed a large study, there was you know a nice publication, a press release from the university, and then we would get inundated with calls from families, 
uh, from who wanted to get family members tested, their kids uh, uh, get calls from doctors, and there was no way for us to to help them because they couldn't just come to you know my academic labs and get tested. Those were all things done in a research setting. So, a couple of years ago, along with some very experienced colleagues in the field that um, I'll introduce in one of the slides, we put together Mindex Sciences, and then. Um, this summer, we were very fortunate to have Jerome uh, join us and lead the Mental Health Transformation Advisory Board and uh, really give us vision and energize our efforts about how we can have a broader societal impact. You'll also hear today at the end uh, from Sunil Hazarai, who's the president of Mindex, a very experienced executive in the diagnostic field who um, joined this effort over a, a year ago and has um, um, spearhead that the practical rollout of our product. So let me share the screen. And again, you know, uh, we're colleagues, I'm an academic, I encourage questions, just, you know, stop me at any time if something is, um, um, you know, unclear. And uh, I will also um, leave a bit of time at the end for us to, to go over it. So do you all see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes. All right, good. So let's proceed. So Mindex Sciences was uh, from the beginning um, conceptualized to be um, a complete package. So our logo, those three circles, the outer circle is digital. Uh, we want to get a, a good assessment of the phenotype. And nowadays that's done with digital tools, with apps, the, which brings people to the middle circle, which is molecular testing. And this is where we had breakthroughs over the last 15 years in terms of developing blood tests that can track psychiatric symptoms and assess risk, sort of like a liquid biopsy. Uh, Dr. Adams mentioned cancer as a field that we look to in terms of catching up with and maybe surpassing in the future. And then the, the inner circle, uh, which looks like a tablet, is therapeutics. Once you have somebody's molecular profile, you can actually match them in an informed way to a medication as opposed to the usual trial and error or pattern recognition skills that we rely on. <clears throat> um, so, you know, um, I think uh, the previous speakers have already uh, really outlined the, the problem that we're facing. Um, these are very common problems and for uh, a lot of the things that are done in current practice are really, you know, could have been done in the 19th century or maybe early 20th century. In a lot of settings, we still rely on talking to a patient on um, using our, um, you know, clinical intuition, our clinical skills to assess somebody and um, you know, uh, I think uh, there are uh, opportunities now to improve upon that. And one analogy is, you know, we're still flying without instruments. So we're in a, a plane, we're looking out the window so we can fly. And what our work and uh, Mindex Sciences uh, uh, aim to help um, doctors with is to provide some instrumentation, some objective measures. In the end, you're the pilot, you fly the plane as you want. Uh, the additional instrumentation is there to make your life easier. And this is by no means an autopilot. Uh, so we're not, uh, you know, in any way uh, supplanting the crucial uh, input of a physician who knows the patient best, has the therapeutic alliance, can integrate other factors into a treatment plan and so on. Um, so we do that by having, you know, a platform approach. We go from as I mentioned, from digital assessments to blood tests to matching with medications. And uh, we have some efforts in terms of um, repurposed drugs, which is a topic that also has been, um, you know, more on the radar screen recently for COVID and for other disorders. Can existing things be used? Uh, we have to be less controversial than that area. We go with evidence and uh, we see how we can fit in. So, um, this is our pipeline. Uh, we go from things that are, um, you know, major imminent emergencies like preventing suicide to things where um, that, you know, that correlate with uh, psychiatric disorders that are highly comorbid like pain to some of the disorders that we treat on a daily basis. And uh, I'm still a practicing psychiatrist. I see patients um, a day and a half a week, in addition to running my uh, research operations and uh, helping run Mindex with Sunil. 
And um, these are some of the disorders for which we have rolled out blood tests. Uh, and uh, these are uh, the ones with the asterisk. In the next six months or so, we also hope to roll out the blood test panel for anxiety and another one for uh, psychosis. So um, all of this work um, has been uh, based on science that was first published in peer-reviewed journals. Um, then, you know, the university filed patent applications, the company licensed those patent applications and developed uh, nice user-friendly products. And Sunil will speak at the end a little bit about some of the products that are now available to select doctors in an early access program. Um, and, and these are the products um, we, um, that are currently rolled out. We have an app, Life and Mind. Uh, it's available in the Google Store, the Apple Store. So there are Apple and Google versions. Um, we didn't sort of just have an app to have an app. There are 7,000 other apps for mental health with various degrees of cuteness or uh, you know, user friendliness or content uh, seriousness and so on. Uh, what we have done, however, was over the last 15 years, we developed very quantitative and simple instruments, rating scales to track anxiety, mood, psychosis, stress, et cetera. And those paper instruments that were used as part of our research, clinical research studies and for our biomarker discovery, then now are in a digital format in this app. So the way to think about this app is it's like a Fitbit for the mind. Um, the patient can keep track at home every day how they feel, how they think. Uh, they can keep track how life events influence their, their feelings and thoughts. And then they can email you a report or bring it to you to your appointment. So when you ask them, how has your mood been over the last three months since I last saw you, instead of them trying to remember and giving you a, a response that's biased by the, their current sort of state, you can actually see it, you know, the data for how their mood was. Was it up and down? Was it stable? Was it consistently low? Same thing for stress, same thing for anxiety, same thing for pain. So um, in many ways, it's a, you know, it's, it's a medical device, but it's in a consumer friendly fashion. They can use it and become sort of addicted in a good way to it in terms of uh, um, you know, using it on a daily basis um, to just know themselves and improve their lives. There are some features that are nice in it. There is a science-based mind type um, feature that we just rolled out last week where people are classified into different subtypes of uh, how their mind works. It's all based on data and on data collected in the app. And that again is useful for you as their doctor, for their therapist, for them uh, in terms of how they see themselves, how they want to improve themselves and so on. The second product is Essex Prevent. This is uh, like a suicide risk score assessment that's done in a quantitative way. So you get the number for suicide risk and you also get a personalized treatment plan for that patient to mitigate that suicide risk. It doesn't ask about suicidal ideation. So it's easy to administer in any setting. In fact, the research over the last decade that led to the development of this instrument, we did it by asking people, you know, administering the questionnaire to people uh, in all sorts of settings with veterans in um, uh, busy urban ER settings and so on. It takes three to five minutes to administer it. We also did it based on medical records so the patient doesn't have to be there or we did it with next of kin in the case of suicide completers. And you get a score, a quantitative score that indicates risk. So then you get this report with almost like a traffic light feature, red high risk, yellow intermediate risk, green low risk. One way to think about it is uh, almost like a financial credit report that you get from your bank or a FICO score, where you have a number there, what your credit score and a list of things you can do to improve that. Same thing here, we did that for suicide. And um, it's something that uh, is prescription only. There's a CPT code for it if you use it, so you can get reimbursed. And uh, the way it works is, um, you know, you prescribe it for a patient, they get an electronic token, they can go to a secure website, take the test, you get the report, and then you discuss it with the patient at the future encounter and set together a treatment plan to improve uh, their lives and mitigate the suicide risk factor. And as Dr. Adams and Dr. Coley have mentioned, suicide is multifactorial. Uh, so it's very important to uh, capture all these risks. 
I've seen complicated patients for two decades now, even um, you know, ever since my my clinical training in psychiatry at UC San Diego, my residency there, and um, after two decades, I, uh, I, it's hard for me to juggle in my head when I see a patient 22 risk factors for suicide, whereas this instrument does it, um, quantitates it, and provides you that information in an actionable way. The third product is a blood test. Um, this is simple. It goes from vein to a tube, stable at room temperature. The nurse just inverts it 10 times. It's stabilized and then FedExes it to our partner lab, uh, which is a very large uh, organization called Q2. Uh, it's affiliated with, it's a unit of IQVIA. Uh, I won't bore you with sort of the laboratory testing business landscape, but it's a very large corporation. They do state-of-the-art testing for large pharma and they partner with us on this. They do the blood testing. We get the raw data at Mindex, analyze it, and then provide the report to you, the doctor, a prescription only test and uh, you get a nice dashboard where the report is put so we don't have to use uh, fax machines or e-faxes if you prefer faxes we can fax it to you but uh, most people like to have uh, a nice uh, dashboard where they can organize the data from this and for their patient population from the different report you can also import the report in your electronic medical records whatever system you use as a just like an external laboratory report and the report is structured the same way as um, I mentioned for the SX Prevent, meaning uh, I'll show you in a minute. Um, actually, let me go to that and I'll come back to this. So this is how a sample report looks like. And so this is actually a report that we provided to a, a patient of a doctor who ordered it. Uh, we just de-identified to show. So you get that this was a report for pain. A lot of our sort of uh, initial orders are actually from concierge doctors, primary care doctors, internists who are very pragmatic. They see a lot of actual initial mental health patients before they get to us psychiatrists. And they, they, they're used to ordering tests. They want uh, something to help them make the assessment. And uh, they uh, you know, uh, don't have an ego. They don't think they can necessarily diagnose or treat mental health patients. Uh, so they're sort of uh, first adopters of this. So you, you get an, a score, overall pain score, or it could be a suicide score or a depression score, depending what report uh, you, you ordered. Uh, it gives you a state severity score for that moment in time. It gives you a short-term risk score for the first year ahead and a long-term risk score for the future. And this is all based on comparisons with databases of people that we've tested over the last 15 years where we have normative data. Then you get a nice report divided into nutraceuticals and pharmaceuticals matching that patient. So in this case of this patient, um, the best, and, and it's ranked from the best match to lower matches. So for the pharmaceuticals, um, as a steroid was the best match, dexamethasone. There are some other NSAIDs, Motrin is here and so on. Interestingly, opiates were at the bottom of the list, which I think was very helpful, I think, to his doctors so that he could say, well, we don't necessarily need to start you on oxycodone. You're a better match for something that's safer for you and so on. But look on the nutraceutical side, uh, and this is all empirical data that he is a great match for omega-3 fatty acids and vitamin D and other things like that. So again, in the end, it's all biology and gene expression. So whether the compound comes from a nutraceutical or from a pharmaceutical, it acts as strongly on biology. So again, treatment options, because um, some people may prefer not to take a pharmaceutical or may uh, want to supplement their, uh, as a doctor, you may want to also give them nutraceuticals in addition to their pharmaceuticals and so on. This is all done in a CLIA setting. We have accreditation for it. We have uh, applied for CPT codes from the American Medical Association. We received notice today that we got CPT codes for six indications. Um, they'll become official as of January so that you can use that code when you bill for it. And uh, the next step for us is to apply uh, for Medicare and um, uh, other insurance reimbursement for over the next um, year or so. Sunil is spearheading that. For now, these are out of pocket uh, of costs um, for these tests, but uh, Sunil will talk about how we're trying to make these affordable. Um, so 
let me show you some, you know, an image is worth a thousand words. This is how the Life and Mind app looks. So sort of a very nice user-friendly screen, kind of looks like my Fitbit screen. And it gives, uh, you know, in this case of this person, it also gave them what's your mind type for the day was perfectionist. You can click on that and see what's your mind type over the last week, over the last month, over the last year. You have your assessments here. All these assessments that we developed were validated against the usual suspects, right? So we validated our mood assessments against the Hamilton, the Young, the psychosis against the pants, anxiety against the stay and so on. So this is all, um, you know, it's not, just sort of cute stuff that's made up. Uh, this is the suicide digital product that sex revenge that I described. So the patient gets sort of a nice uh, QR code that they can go to and, and take the test after you prescribe it. That's the pain report. And a uh, last effort that sort of inner circle is uh, we, based on our biomarker work, we came up with a combination of uh, two repurposed drugs, a beta blocker and a lipid lowering medication that can be added to your current treatments for bipolar depression. A lot of those people have metabolic syndrome, cardiac comorbidity. So this would be very synergistic. We'll have, we think efficacy for their mood, but also mitigate some of those side effects. And we're now um, in discussions to find a, a pharmaceutical, a, a big pharma partner to develop this with us along with the companion blood test. So this is the team that started on this journey. Um, um, myself, Sunil Hazarik, who you'll meet in a minute, and we have these three arms. Uh, Felix Wiss is leading the digital efforts, uh, Sunil Curry and the molecular efforts, and uh, Steve Stahl is leading the interactions with pharma. Uh, Steve Stahl was uh, years ago my mentor when I was in training, and we've remained friends and collaborators over the years. Uh, and these are some of the other sort of co-founders or uh, advisory board members and so on. I want to highlight here Ananta Shaker, who was one of the early co-founders who is now um, in Pittsburgh. He's, he uh, moved there as dean of the medical school close to where Ravi is and uh, might be a future speaker at one of your events. Uh, he's a terrific guy and again was a mentor of mine when we did this research over the years here in Indiana. Um, so I, I think this was already mentioned and uh, you know, I, I don't need to belabor this point, but um, we're losing, you know, in the 20 minutes or 30 minutes that we've been talking about this, we've, we've lost the number, you know, another sort of uh, number of people um, unnecessarily. These are preventable tragedies. If you know that somebody is at risk, you can intervene. So, you know, one way I think about it, uh, and I'm a very sort of simple-minded and pragmatic guy, is that suicide is like a heart attack. You want to identify the risk factors for a heart attack early um, and mitigate them, whether it's, you know, before you actually have the coronary event where it might be too late or it might leave uh, a lot of damage. Uh, so, you know, the numbers are staggering. Um, one number that is really sort of, uh, you know, always on my mind is that over 10 million people a year in the US have suicidal thoughts, okay? Uh, now, and those are only the people who admit it because that's why we know they have suicidal thoughts. There might be more that have and don't admit. So how do you know which of those 10 million people, how do you know as a doctor, which of those 10 million people will go on to be the 1 million that act attempt it, which is very dangerous because they could actually, you know, do it if they attempt it. And among those uh, 50,000 a year that actually complete suicide. So we need better tools. I need better tools. All of us need better tools to um, triage these patients. So that's why we developed these assessments. So the Life and Mind apps keep track of their suicidal ideation at home. They can record that. The SX Prevent keeps track of their risk factors. And the blood test for suicidality um, provides you an objective assessment and matches them with the right um, medications to decrease risk. Uh, we have a big problem in veterans as well. Uh, I work with part-time with veterans. They're very near and dear to my heart and um, we lose over 20 every day. And uh, we're very worried about uh, uh, that, you know, every single day uh, with, with the events that are happening and so on. So um, coming from academia, we tend to sort of be conservative when we make claims. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, 
sort of try to under promise and uh, over deliver. So in everybody who we've tested, our blood tests are uh, over 70% accurate in, in seven out of 10, more than seven out of 10 people, you can um, sort of assess them, classify them correctly, whether they are sick or not, high risk or not. Number is about 75%, or we'd like to say over 70%. The digital tests are um, even more accurate. They're over 80% accurate in terms of um, classifying somebody. So for example, in the case of suicide, the SX prevent is uh, over 80% accurate in classifying who will have future events. Um, when you go to high risk groups, um, like people with bipolar disorder and so on, just the molecular tests are over 90% accurate. So in that particular context in high-risk people, um, even the blood test is, uh, becomes extremely highly accurate. When you combine them, you get uh, over 95% accuracy if you combine the digital products and the molecular products. And that's you know actionable information that uh, can help uh, guide uh, clinical practice and can help sort of try to mitigate and prevent these tragedies. Um, as Dr. Adams mentioned, um, we didn't just limit ourselves to studying suicide risk factors and developing tests for that, but you also have to go broader and upstream. And we've developed tests, also a blood test for pain, a blood test for depression and bipolar disorder, and a blood test for PTSD, among other things. So you can early on identify some of the main upstream drivers of suicide and uh, intervene there before people sort of reach this crisis point. And those are major disorders in their own right. We see them day in and day out in our clinical practice and having tests that can, can provide some information that can match people with the right medication is something that uh, has practical utility for all of us. Um, so what, what's... Uh, what's our uh, edge, what's our offering, what makes us a bit different than other companies who are out there. So first of all, um, you know, uh, we've done the research and then wrapped the company around it to roll out products. We're not sort of a company that has great stories and raises a lot of money to do the research moving forward like a lot of those Silicon Valley companies. Um, we're modest, we're Midwestern, we, we've sort of did the work and now we want to get it into people's hands. And uh, it was very slow and patient work, accumulating all these um, cohorts, uh, testing them, coming up with the findings, then validating them, then uh, replicating in independent cohorts. So our databases now are uh, you know, an asset, very hard to duplicate. If somebody read our publication and wanted to rip us off and uh, commercialize the biomarkers, they wouldn't have the database to compare them with. So then how, the, how are they going to assess if somebody is at risk or not? And um, you know the, the assessments that are now in the digital product, the blood tests, these were all developed together in clinical research settings. So they work very well together. This work was funded by the NIH, by the VA. So we've been very well funded over the years, continuously funded for the last two decades, still are very well funded with the uh, big grant from each of these organization. Um, and the team that we've put together is um, a very experienced team. And I think that's sort of the most important asset. Um, over 20 major publications from my group and my collaborators over the years that did directly relate to the work that went into these products. So uh, I'd like now to pass over, uh, to pass the baton over to Sunil Hazarai, our president, who really has been instrumental in uh, are rolling out this product and he'll tell you a little bit about how uh, our early access plan works. Um, Sunil, please take it over. <laughs> and I'll, I'll uh, move the slides for you so we don't lose time switching. All right, uh, thank you, Dr. Bob, uh, for that uh, uh, very comprehensive talk and uh, kind of an overview about the, the background, the products and the utility and the data you have to base these decisions on. And uh, I invite uh, Sunil now to uh, talk more the nitty gritty, the granular details about how to use this product. What is the way the clinicians can uh, utilize these services in these products? Go ahead, Sunil. Right, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kohli, and thank you, Dr. Nikolescu. Uh, 
um, it always happens when Bob uh, gives a speech uh, and then I follow him. Uh, and the first question in people's minds is, okay, uh, these are great products, uh, so how do I get them? And that's uh, what we are going to uh, look at now. So let's see how uh, best we can get them. You will see the first slide here, which uh, Bob has put up. Uh, and uh, we're, not, we're not seeing any slides yet. Uh, so. Oh, we're not Bob, seeing please. the slides. Okay. Um, let me see if I uh, can can I continue to share the screen. Right. Okay. If not, then I can uh, I can uh, uh, do it from let my me... end here. Yeah, go ahead. Let me share that. from your end. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Do you, uh, I have it ready, Sunil. Do you want me to continue to yeah, share? Yeah, please. Yeah, if you can, that would okay. be great. All right. Uh, Good. Great. So. So the question, of course, uh, which is in people's minds is uh, great. These are great tests. I would like to uh, put them uh, on my patients or I would like to try them out for my patients. And how do I access them? So when you look at the Mindex Sciences products, as Bob mentioned, we have about six blood tests which are already in the market. Uh, as up until a few hours ago, we did not have CPT codes but we just got notification from the American Medical Association that we will have CPT codes starting January 1st, 2022. So the good news is that uh, we will get CPT codes. And as Bob said, once we get CPT codes, we are going to go in for CMS reimbursement and also reimbursement by health insurance companies. Uh, however, at this stage, these products are available uh, for private pay patients or cash pay patients. And I'll explain to you, though they, these tests may seem to be very expensive, how we can make it a very inexpensive proposition as well. So we first start with the Life and Mind app, which is a very simple app. And as you know, apps are not very expensive. It just costs $20. Uh, the good news is that if you and your patients use the app, uh, by you, what I mean is not you using the app, but if your patients download the data and send it to you, which of course would be very objective data, then you can use a CPT code 96127 and actually get reimbursement for every encounter when the patient sends the data over to you. And the uh, reimbursement is about $39. We also have a questionnaire, which is SX Prevent. And this is a very useful questionnaire and very pertinent to what we have been discussing today. Dr. Adams started off by saying about how serious suicide is to our general population. And of course, uh, one of the uh, uh, methods of preventing suicide is to detect ideation much earlier. And you can detect that through the SX Prevent questionnaire, as uh, Bob mentioned. Uh, this is a questionnaire where people can go on their, uh, on their laptops or on their phones and do the questionnaire. It's a very simple questionnaire and we charge $95 a year. And this will give you the ability to assess the risk of suicide of the patient. Once again, this has a CPT code. It is 96161. And for every encounter, you get reimbursed $37. Now we come to the blood tests, which are very novel. Uh, these are uh, gene expression tests, have been used earlier in cancer and transplant. Uh, and now coming into the, they are now coming into the field of psychiatry with all the work for the last 17 years that Bob has done. Uh, so we have different tests and I know that on the, uh, on our Zoom side, there were some questions as to what kind of tests these are. So here is the list. We have a blood test for pain. We have a blood test for mood disorders. We have a blood test for stress. We have a blood test for suicidality. A blood test for memory disorders and a blood test for longevity. And each of these blood tests cost $1,800. And you might say to me, well, you know, this is really very expensive. But when you look at it from the lens of a cancer or transplant, where these or similar kinds of tests have been used, uh, in, in those areas, these tests cost you more than $3,000. What we have also done is because they are whole transcriptum uh, tests for the patient, if a patient wants an extra disease report, 
So let's suppose you have ordered a Mindex blood test for stress. Uh, and uh, you then want to see whether that is leading to suicidality. So the extra, by paying extra $200, you can get a report on suicidality as well. So makes it very simple and very easy. Uh, there was a question by somebody uh, which said, uh, what, uh, give us some more details about the pain test. And uh, if, uh, I don't know, Dr. Coley, if uh, we can have these comments uh, uh, printed out a little later because we can send the answers to the individuals. Would that be- uh, an Yeah, okay I can, I can uh, yeah, I can copy the chat and uh, uh, create a questionnaire from that and uh, send it to Great. you. And we but can send we it can, to uh, yeah, yeah, if we can uh, answer some of them. Sure. I will uh, I'll moderate the discussion at the end a little bit. So uh, Bob and you can shed some light on individual questions if you can. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, with yeah. Whatever you're allowed to say by the FDA or whatever. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. Now we are happy to do that. Absolutely. Um, so this is the extra report. Now, how do we pay for these tests, especially blood tests? So we have three options. One is, of course, there are some people who would say, uh, and I've, I've seen patients really who have come forward and I've seen patients' relatives come forward and say to me, well, you know, what is $1,800 versus the harrowing experience you have when somebody commits suicide or the harrowing experience you have when somebody is, uh, is, is bipolar and so on and so forth. So there are some people who are willing to pay the cash upfront, so that's cash payment. Uh, there are others who cannot pay the cash, but they're very willing to go through health savings accounts. And these days, I think most people like us who are working do have health savings accounts. And some of these people can pay for their loved ones or for themselves through a health savings account. And that's possible. And the third part of it is we have we recently got into a contract with an organization called Care Credit. And some of you might be very well aware of that because Care Credit deals with medical devices which are very expensive, like hearing aids and so on and so forth. And they make it very uh, affordable by converting the $6,000 or so for hearing aids into a very simple monthly payment. And we do the same here. So if you go to Care Credit, uh, you can log in, you can type in the name of our company, Mindex Sciences, and you can, uh, you can, you can then say what tests you want. Uh, and based on the total amount, they will give you either a 12 month or a 24 month option. So let's go to the next slide. And you will see that if, you or, if your patient orders a Mindex blood test for stress, which will be $1,800, uh, you also want an extra report for suicide, suicidality, which is another $200. So the total price is $2,000. For a 12 equal monthly payments, all your patient is paying is $166. Or if they want to go in for a 24 month payment, all they're paying is $83. And it all of a sudden becomes very affordable. Uh, I'm not saying that this will continue to, for long because we are going to insurance companies and we will get reimbursement. But in the meantime, these are facilities which are available to your patients. So that was the sum and uh, substance of it. This is how uh, we bring the technology to the market and make it affordable for most patients. Uh, any questions, uh, Dr. Kohli, if you want to moderate, we are happy to answer. Yeah, uh, the, the last question is uh, about the cost and uh, affordability of the test which is a major concern. And hopefully with some advocacy and uh, insurances and, the, uh, and all those things can come into play eventually, uh, at least mm -hmm. after January, maybe they might be yes. reimbursed by the insurance more completely. And uh, meanwhile, there are some academic questions. Uh, Dr. Brahma Sharma, my good friend from Pittsburgh asked, uh, is there any specific test to kind of genetic yeah. test to choose the medicine, what choice, instead of going through trial and error methodology, yeah. can we do testing that will specifically to uh, make a choice of treatment? I yeah. think you mentioned in the pain, do you have something similar in depression? All, all, all the reports are the same. I just sort of right. showed that one, but uh, all the reports are the same. You get the, you know, your, 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 your risk scores there, overall risk score, you get the state number, the immediate risk, the long-term risk, 
and then you get the list of medications and that matching is based on gene expression pattern in the panel. So you have a panel of biomarkers for each of these disorders. Uh, the panels usually vary in size from 12 to 56 biomarkers, depending on which particular indication. And based on uh, which genes are increased or decreased, you, you get a match with the uh, medication. The match can be stronger, so then the medication is far, higher up the list or lower. And again, this match is based on biology, which is different than some of the tests that some of us use currently in our practice, where uh, we look at uh, those uh, DNA tests, where you, you look at pharmacokinetics, essentially, the tests that are marketing by to uh, companies that uh, essentially uh, tell you whether somebody is a slow or fast metabolizer. You know, I'm referring to the Myriad Neuroscience one and the Genomind one. So those are useful tests. Tells you, you know, should I use a high dose of Paxil, low dose of Paxil, et cetera. But it's not a real match with the biology. Where it's in our case, we don't look at pharmacokinetics. We look, with, does this medication normalize the biological profile of this patient? So that's, uh, that's sort of how that uh, piece is done. And we, we think that uh, that is actually one of the major strengths of the test because some of us you know, are great diagnostician just by talking to patients and looking at, at them, or we can use the digital assessments to get a, a sense of whether somebody is doing well or not, whether they're bipolar or just depressed, et cetera. But the matching with medications, it's, it's something that even the best of us have to do empirically at this point. We try this medication, but if it doesn't work six weeks later, we try another one, et cetera. And that's sort of uh, sometimes uh, months or years until people um, end up on the right combination. Sometimes you're, you're, they're prescribed the wrong medication. They are bipolar, but they present with depression and they get put on an antidepressant monotherapy and then go into a mixed state or hypomanic state and so on. And then people say, well, they're not responding. Let's try another antidepressant. So, you know, I see cases all the time. People get referred to me from around the state and, and across the country where they've been tried on five, six different antidepressants. And, you know, that should have been a clue that, you know, there's something else going on. So, you know, we diagnose them. They have bipolar disorder. They get started on a mood stabilizer. We clean up their medications, et cetera. So, the matching with medication is a very important piece, uh, in my opinion, for these tests. And it's done based on biology. It's not done based on any other information. Bob, if I heard you right, so you're able to tell the diagnosis of the condition, uh, bipolar versus depression? Uh, so, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So with, with our mood disorders panel, that was a, a big study that we published earlier this year. Um, got a lot of uh, attention from colleagues, very positive uh, feedback from colleagues, from the media, et cetera. It was uh, sort of uh, featured all over, had an article written about it in The Economist, et cetera. So that test actually can look whether it's just depression or whether it's bipolar. So when somebody presents with depression, you do that test and it tells you, you know, it's major depressive disorder or there's a bipolar risk component to it. And that's very useful to know right off the bat. There are a lot of patients who uh, actually, you know, go for years misdiagnosed and mistreated for depression. And the fact they have bipolar just because it was sort of a bipolar too, it didn't have the overt mania at the beginning, so they didn't get diagnosed correctly. Um, so I think that's going to be sort of an immediate impact of that test in terms of helping with that uh, clarification. Right. Bob, that's very intriguing what you said. Because a lot of my patients keep asking me, these are a blood test for uh, my illness. And I keep telling them there's nothing there. So maybe I had to change my answer now to there is a blood test for yeah, to yeah. differentiate uh, the diagnosis. That's kind of an amazing uh, piece of information. So we may be getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but, uh, but some people have some questions about the specific power. What are you measuring? Are you looking at the, like a third gene or uh, like some genes that are more common for like they're all yeah. So you know, I, yeah. you know, I was you very know, tempted. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was very tempted to give the the science talk <laughs> because we're among colleagues. So I had my science slide decks. I wanted to go into details, but I, I figure you know, uh, you, you know, people are interested in how they can use this pragmatically, how they can sort of improve their practice, how they can help their patients better. So. And we, you know, in the interest of time, I didn't want to sort of do my, my usual academic lecture type of thing, but mm -hmm. I can, uh, I'll, I'll mention three things. So first of yeah. all, um, 
mindexsciences.com, the company website, has there an uh, FAQ frequently answered questions, uh, frequently asked questions section, the FAQ tab in uh, the Mindex Sciences website, where we provide a lot of detail how the tests are done. There's also a video there of an academic lecture describing all the sort of science behind it. We provide a list of all of our publications with the PubMed ID and a link so you can go there directly and get the article and uh, a lot of the background. There's also the academic website of my uh, research groups. It's called neurophenomics.info. Again, there's a lot of information there about how we did these things. But uh, basically, these are RNA tests. So we look at how active genes are or not. You know, they, you know the RNAs are uh, sort of the expression of the genes. When a gene is turned on, they make a lot of RNAs. When it's turned off, very little RNAs or nothing. And uh, you can actually... Uh, you know, actually see if somebody, you know, is sick and what's the interaction between genes and environment when you look at an RNA level uh, or when you look at the protein level. As opposed to DNA, which is there from the beginning, it doesn't change. Um, it's uh, very far away from sort of the disease phenotype because there are all these other layers from DNA to actual disease manifestation. You have RNA, protein, gene environment interaction. So these are dynamic tests. They can become part of your... Now you can do them before you start somebody on a treatment or while they're on a treatment and not doing well. And then when you get the data, you can inform, adjust your choices of treatment. You can do them at every six months or yearly to catch early on when if somebody is not doing well, to preempt them going into a severe episode. And you know, in terms of costs, we try to cut it as much as possible uh, because we want people to have access. There's all this sort of tragedy and suffering. and I. I I've told you over the years, I get all this sort of emails from families and patients, and I respond to every single one of them. Um, and the, the, it, you know, the value proposition that we're going to make to insurers is that, first of all, these tests, we price them $1,000 less than comparable tests that are sold for cancer or for transplant, like Sunil mentioned. But the other thing is they cost less than a day of hospitalization. So that's the value to insurers, you know. Would you rather pay for somebody to be hospitalized for three days, five days, seven days, or would you pay for a test that would permit them to do well and so on? And then from the patient's perspective, nobody wants to sort of spiral into a severe unless to be hospitalized, to, to spend months or years uh, not doing well, uh, being lost to society, being lost to their families, being lost to their employers. Uh, so there's a, a lot of value there, and that's the argument that we're crafting to get reimbursement, uh, because not everybody can, you know, afford to pay these things out of pocket. We want to get, uh, like Sunil, uh, you know, is mentioning, and um, I'm a fan of Tesla, so we want to get the Model 3 out as, as quick as possible. Right now we have the Roadster. <laughs> <laughs> We're moving towards the Model S, but we want to get the Model 3s on the market so everybody can use these tests. So we're moving, we're working very hard to, to make these tests simpler Great. and reimbursed and so on. There's an interesting question here. Are there any outcomes uh, data uh, based on your testing, the treatment provided? Are there any outcomes from that? No, that we don't have yet outcomes data. So that's the part that the company will do much better than we could have done in the academic research. Every single um, you know, uh, patient that gets tested, there's an opt-in option that they can opt, they and their physicians can opt to share some of their data in a de-identified way with, with, with us uh, over time. So we can actually look at outcomes and so on. What we did show was that the biomarkers are very predictive of future events. Uh, you know, your, your biomarker levels from years ago uh, predict, you know, how, you know, how you are doing now. So uh, that, that type of uh, work was possible because we followed people longitudinally over years and had the electronic medical records and could see how people had certain biomarkers levels converted to disease state over time. But we don't have yet the large scale um, health economics and large scale impact data. And that's something that with the product rollout in the real world, we will accumulate. Every patient that we test, they will have that option to share some of that information with us, the identified, so we can put together, sure. you know, these larger, um, you know, outcome type studies. 
Thank you, thank you, Bob. I have a thought in my mind. Uh, we know the childhood trauma and abuse have significant impact on yeah. the onset of depression and the continuation of depression, treatment, response, and suicidality. Is there anything that you have in your testing has any, I know you talked about PTSD uh, in the veteran. Do you have anything else in the general population in that category? Well, uh, these things translate across, uh, there's no sort of difference in all the studies that we've done, uh, veterans, non-veterans, they, they work um, similarly in, in civilian settings. We've done a large study at the large urban hospital with them, but stress is very important. Uh, it's a sort of a, a common denominator of uh, a trigger for psychiatric disorders worsening. So uh, we, um, in, you know, in our suicide um a sex prevent instrument, one of the top ranked items in a lot of the patients that were tested were act, was actually stress, whether acute stress of a loss or chronic stress of isolation. And I think, um, you know, without sort of um, divulging too much, because this is a study that we're writing up right now, we've done a follow up study four years later for the SX prevent, we, we, we had a six months um, study initially where it had 80% accuracy. We've just uh, co completed the analysis on the four-year follow-up on over 500 patients. Uh, and uh, the accuracy has stayed 80% uh, with over this period, which is remarkable because as you go further into the future, things tend to dissipate, but that initial assessment still stayed 80% predictive of future events at, at the four-year follow-up. Uh, but more importantly, the top item there, and this surprised me, I would have thought, you know, unhappiness, lack of hope. No, the top item, head and shoulders about all the other items in the SX Prevent as a risk factor was social isolation, feeling not needed. Mm -hmm. so, so there, you know, we can end on this sort of, uh, you know, um, note where we, there's something concrete that we can all use in our practice as a, as a take home message. I, I think, you know, um, Dr. Adams, Dr. Murthy, others are, are onto something. This social isolation is an extremely powerful detrimental risk factors for disease of despair in general and for suicide in particular. So if there's one thing that you can take from this and put to more in your practice is make sure that your patients are not isolated. Find ways to have their family members, their friends, uh, their uh, religious community, other people connect with them on a regular basis. And you probably would do a lot in terms of reducing suicide risk. You hit the nail in the head, Dr. Bob, about social isolation. Actually, I've been studying that a lot. And the pain of social isolation as real as the physical pain, the brain studies have shown that. And it is not just a psychological feeling. It's a physical pain that they feel from social isolation. And it's, a, it's an evolutionary mechanism behind it, you know as a scientist and a PhD, that the, the social embedding is part of uh, our survival. When we were in, our ancestors lived in the caves and uh, that gene is imprinted in us, that, that uh, connectivity is so important that I think Dr. Marty wrote a, an amazing book uh, in recently, the Surgeon General. And, uh, the, and like I said, uh, there's a ministry of loneliness in the UK and now in Japan. And um, I think that is a key factor, I think going forward, uh, social isolation, how to beat it. And uh, there's a social contagion effect as well. The happiness can be contagious, just like uh, COVID is contagious. Depression is contagious and as well. So you really hit the nail on the head on the loneliness aspect. And we can go on and on. And uh, uh, there are a lot of good questions and I will uh, put them all together and uh, send it to Sunil. And uh, uh, let's see if I have any other interesting questions I missed here. And, and come to our website. You can use that email info at mindexsciences.com yes. for any yes, questions. Sunil, you want we... to post your website uh, link there so you, people can, uh, on the chat box yes. also, they can yeah. definitely just uh, uh, access Google. it right away. Yeah. And, Google uh, mindexsciences.com and uh, there's our website. Uh, there's an email there where you can contact us. You can sign up yeah. for our newsletter. We'll have that. We have a newsletter that goes out every weekend. You can sign mm -hmm. up for that uh, and, uh, you know, stay in touch, give us feedback. Uh, we would love to learn how we can help you do, uh, you know, a better job for your patients, how we can improve our products. We really appreciate your time now after a day of hard work being here with us. And uh, 
you know, uh, look forward to staying in touch. So thank you all. Yeah, Bob, yeah, I've been getting those newsletters myself since I signed up. And thank you for all that uh, amazing science you have done behind this yes. product. And so th um, thank you all. And thank you very much, Dr. Adams, for, uh, for honoring us with your presence and your vision and guidance. Uh, thank you, Sunil, for spearheading our product development yeah. and uh, running the company oh, so well. And uh, thank you, Ravi. I look forward to future interactions. No, definitely. We really enjoyed the topic. I think we just scratched the surface. There's much more to talk about, I think, as the product rolls out and there's more information and more wide acceptance. And yeah, some of invite, that, some invite of us that. back and we'll talk next time about the depression and bipolar test. But this Absolutely. month, really, we should all pay attention to suicide and try to make a dent in this problem. And let's start with, uh, with minimizing social isolation for anybody that we encounter. Just, right. uh, and if you have any patients it. whom you want to uh, try this uh, or use this product, please don't hesitate to go on our website, go at info at mindexsciences.com and just send us an email. And there's a, yeah. a tab there for clinicians where they can sign up to get kits from us, kits for the blood tests and everything. So visit our website. We've put a lot of resources there. Thank you all right. very much and uh, have a nice evening. It was wonderful spending so, time with so you. So we'll uh, close the session. I think the, the take home points are suicide is preventable. Suicide is somewhat uh, predictable and, uh, and uh, isolation is uh, deadly and uh, social isolation is as dangerous to your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Science has proven that. So tell your patient not to worry alone. Tell them to worry with us and worry along with us. So we will worry together that makes it easier for them to kind of cope. So I think it's a really interesting talk. I think we have learned a lot, but there's so much more to learn. So we're looking forward to more sessions and more science, more, more uh, clinical utility that we can go for, get from these uh, products. So um, we will end the talk here. Anupama, you want to say any concluding remarks for uh, our um, audience and our speakers? First of all, uh, thank you so much. I'm an anesthesiologist, so, but uh, I, I learned something out of this talk today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nicolescu. Your, your research is, yeah, you have, you know, done years and years of research and came up with such a wonderful product. Hopefully this product will help our patients. And I'm so glad that a CPT code is coming out too for you guys to, uh, so that the patients can be reimbursed and very affordable. So it's a new product now, but from January, once you get this code out, I think it will become more and more affordable to our patients. And my basic question was, can a primary care physician also apply all these products and CPT codes, or is it only the yes. scientist? No, the answer is yes. To do this, see that that makes a big difference. Because... Any doctor, any doctor. In fact, most of the uh, physicians part of our early access program are not psychiatrists. As I mentioned, we have a lot of pain doctors. We have concierge doctor, internists. Um, you know, mental health. Um, problems, 80% uh, of mental health problems are being seen by non-psychiatrists, at least initially, mm -hmm. you know, they present there, and then sometimes it takes years until they get to a specialist like us. So by all means, you know, um, come to our website and uh, there's a clinician tab over there and any of the tests that you're interested or kits or information, please sign up and uh, happy to, to send you those things. It's also interesting that patients also can themselves diagnose their own problem and how bad it is their problem. That's a good, good uh, tool actually for the patient. So it's interesting and uh, I wish you very good luck and uh, hopefully, you know, uh, something beneficial for the patients and for the doctors also, you know, it's easy to treat. So thank you so much and uh, good luck to all. And uh, thank you, uh, my beloved members again. Uh, thank Thanks for listening and uh, thanks for your patience. And uh, I'm, I'm so happy that any time on a weekday, if you have more than 100 uh, audience, that's a good, good talk. So thank you so much. Good night. Thank you very much, doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and good night and be all safe. Right. All of you. Have a nice and evening all. We'll thank see you all on uh, September 15th again. <laughs> yeah, you want to talk about your next uh, topics, Anupama, before we close for the rest of them? Yes. 9 11. 
Team, we have an excellent talk again. Uh, it's on Public Health Forum, and uh, it's a panel discussion on health equity and disparities. We have two excellent speakers. One is Dr. Jay Bart, who has tremendous experience on health equity. He's a, he's a teacher by himself, a very young physician. And also Dr. Aleta Maybank, she's the chief equity officer in AMA and senior vice president. Uh, so these are two wonderful speakers. I think we have a lot to learn what is health equity and there's a lot more to listen to them. So I'll see you all on September 15th. Thank you so much. I mean, it's September 11th, right? September 11th, we have a CME talk on uh, right. legal pitfalls. Yeah, the September month is a uh, um, good talks actually, uh, excellent speakers. So that's a CME talk on September 11th. Uh, we'll be sending you the flyers and uh, uh, the times and all. Uh, so there's a little change in the time, but the flyers will come out soon in the newsletters. Yeah. September 11th, Saturday, and September 15th, Wednesday. Two excellent talks. I don't want anyone to miss those two. So yeah, stay tuned. Please come back and uh, good night and have a wonderful uh, week ahead. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>